take off. Yeah, so it's a great pleasure to have Professor Anupam Majumdar from University of Groningen. Uh, I worked with him in many projects earlier and planning to work with him again. Uh, he's a very good speaker and he's going to tell us about entanglement witness for quantum gravity and uh, Gemini protocol. So Anupam, please. Thanks, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you something about a very exciting project. Um, it's about the entanglement, uh, entanglement witness for quantum gravity. And um, it's about to find out uh, the way to test quantum gravity, actually. Um, because um, as, as you know that um, gravity is the only interaction in nature whose uh, classical or quantum feature we, we don't know really. There's no experiment which can tell us that gravity is really quantum. And uh, so this protocol, which we, I'm going to discuss today, will hopefully shed some light uh, into this uh, question. And hopefully, perhaps, maybe one day we would be able to even perform the experiment um, in a laboratory. So quantum superposition of gravity, quantum gravity means essentially you need to think about uh, superposition of geometries. And this is the point which I will be telling you a little bit today. And there were two papers which appeared way back in 2017, uh, 2017, one from our group, as you can see, um, uh, that uh, actually majority of my collaborators in this project are coming from quantum information side, quantum information, quantum technology, and quantum optics group. I'm the only one uh, who comes from the gravity side. And um, simultaneously on the same day, we had another paper by Marletto and Verdel. Uh, you can look at both the papers and see what are the pro uh, prospects in, in this direction. And so let's start with the talk. So the question is very simple. Is gravity classical or quantum? A very simple question, but it's very, very ex extremely hard to even answer this question. One of the reasons is because gravity is extremely weak. It's the weakest interactions of all the interactions we know. And that prohibits many of the uh, uh, which people have been trying to uh, attempt so far. So this is a question which we would like to understand. We would like to see perhaps one day a very, a very clear view of this, uh, whether, the, whether the gravitational interaction is really classical in nature or quantum in nature. Now, there are various levels of excitements you can think about. You can ask yourself, can you put a graviton in a quantum superposition in a laboratory? Um, people have done it for the case of photons, but can you do it for a graviton? And the answer is no, not even in foreseeable future, not even in perhaps in the mankind's history, actually. It's so, so impossible to do it. Can you study, can you take two atoms, let's say hydrogen atoms, and think about a coalescing binary system like what we have seen in LIGO and Virgo, um, uh, uh, the gravitational waves emitting from coalescing black holes, and look at the energy loss and see whether the, that energy itself comes in a quanta. Uh, but now the it has to do with the graviton's emission. And again, the answer is, is impossible because the amount of gravitational wave it would generate, you can compute in your piece of paper, you would find that it's uh, nearly negligible to uh, see how much uh, gravitational wave would this coalescing of atoms would create. Last but uh, not least, a uh, question which you can ask is the following, that can you witness quantum entanglement due to quantum nature of a graviton? And here the answer is yes, it is possible to do so. The experiment is doable, but uh, as far as technology is concerned, we are now lacking behind something like 20, 30 years from um, the real ex experiment. So, but it, it, this is the protocol which I'm going to discuss today with you, um, but uh, the technology is still is lacking right now. So something to look forward to in future. And thanks to many, many people with whom I've had lovely and lively discussions regarding this protocol and uh, the future of how to test quantum nature of gravity. As you know, this is perhaps the last frontier to conquer, if you think about this way. I mean, we have made huge, tremendous progress in understanding 
quantum nature of gravity from a theoretical perspective, but we still do not know whether graviton is really quantum or classical. Oh, so, I have one question, Anupam. Just uh, want to clarify that uh, you, in the previous slide, you have mentioned the loss of the graviton. Can you explain a bit uh, detail why it can't be uh, possible? You can compute the gravitational wave emission and you find it's a very, very small amount. Okay. So, so small that you cannot even register. Your detector cannot register it. Okay. In order to detect a graviton or a couple of gravitons, let's say you need, so Dyson had a wonderful argument that if you want to capture a graviton in like a particle detector, you require even bigger than earth size detector to capture it. That's nearly impossible to make it in a, in a laboratory. Okay. Okay. So anybody have any question, please ask Anupam. Uh, don't need to ask myself. You can just unmute yourself and you can ask Anupam. Now you can continue. Okay, so the plan of my talk is about witnessing quantum gravity. I'll talk about this Gemini protocol, and then I'll talk about how to read the witness and what are the associated challenges and what are the future programs in this direction. So just to brief, uh, brief recap, uh, just to set the stage for gravity, you know very well that gravity is universal and extremely, extremely successful theory especially Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, it explains very well uh, the early universe cosmology when the cosmology which we see today within 100 and 200 megaparsec inverse, H inverse, it explains uh, all the observations. And not, last but not least, recently we have seen many events from gravitational waves, um, uh, which has been detected by LIGO and Virgo and other, um, uh, and in future, hopefully there are many other experiments will join. So you see that Einstein's general relativity has been extremely successful. There is no doubt about it. Having said so, it has also certain features, perhaps which you would not like to see in a decent theory. And that is to do with the cosmological and black hole singularities. Now these singularities are present even in Newton's gravity, one of our potential, as well as these singularities are present in your black hole, as well as very early in the universe in the cosmological context, we have a cosmological singularity. And perhaps in, in real quantum theory of gravity, you would not see any of these singularities appearing in your theory. So, of course, in, 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 in quantum theory of gravity, and hopefully it will be addressed once we understand some of the concepts of quantum gravity a little better. But uh, what worries me the most is actually when the infrared, the low energy aspects of gravity. If you think about it, gravity is the least constrained interactions of all the interactions we know. So this is a plot. You see that uh, you have uh, the, the, uh, the experimentalists like to plot in the x-axis is the distance and then your y-axis is parameter alpha. This is a parameter which appears in your Yukawa potential, Yukawa kind of correction to Newton's gravity, one of our potential. So this is the way the ex experimentalists like to put constraint on Newton's gravity. And as you see that in the bottom half, or uh, uh, very close to roughly um, all the way in the x-axis and in the y-axis, if you go very small values of alpha, you see that there is hardly any constraint on just Newton's one of our potential below, say, millimeter scale. And uh, the corrections so are the, the, the constraints so which appear. Uh, I have a question. They come from large values of alpha. You might have noticed that the plot is very old, 2007. Indeed, it's very old, it's, uh, 17, 10, sorry, more than 10 years have passed by, but um, uh, the progress in this direction is not so huge, I mean, not so much. So there is some, uh, there are some part of, uh, on your top uh, left part has been covered for very, very large values of alpha, but just sheer one of our potential constraints lacking uh, from experiments, uh, experimentalist perspective. So you see that if you really see, uh, compare the various energy scales, you find that, say, even if I take um, uh, any corrections to Newton's potential roughly around one part in 10 to six meter, you see that corresponds to roughly 10 to minus two, 10 to minus three electron volt. And if you go all the way to the Planck energy scale, you don't know whether gravity is really um, uh, attractive or repulsive or how it modifies, how it manifests, you don't know experimentally. There are indirect tests from, uh, of gravity comes from LHC, 
uh, they turn out to be roughly eight to 10 TeV, but they come from the, lack, um, the fact that we have not seen any Kaluza Klein excitations. So from uh, those constraints, we get some indirect constraints in the, at the LHC. Now, having said so, so many people have uh, thought about this problem of uh, quantum mechanics and gravity. It's not a very old, new subject, it's a very, very old subject. And um, the lesson we have learned is that uh, you, can, you can understand or you can, you can actually experimentally see the quantum phase induced by a gravitational potential. Take an example of cow experiment performed way back in 70s, mid 70s, by Kolila, Oberhauser, and Werner, uh, which measured the, uh, the, the Earth's gravitational potential, the phase induced by the Earth's gravitational potential. So Earth's gravitational potential act, was acting like a kind of like a potential well for you. And similarly, there are other proposals like my Mac proposal, and then recently, way back in 2000, uh, in Grenoble, people have done the experiment by throwing neutron, bouncing neutron in a, uh, on Earth's surface and trying to see how the uh, you know, energy states of the neutron looks like. And so these things have been measured. So the quantum, the, the, the phase has been measured and it's, it's possible to measure this phase because the phase goes as action divided by H bar. In the action you have G, the Newton's constant. Newton's constant is a very, very tiny number. H bar is a very tiny number. So you, you still have a sweet spot, the ratio between G over H May not, may not be very tiny, it can be significant, and that's the part which uh, you, know, you, can, you are capturing it in your experiment. But all these experiments have nothing to do with quantumness of gravity. What it tells you that you take a piece of box, you have done it uh, in your undergraduate level problem, you have solved this problem many, many times, infinite dimensional potential well, and you have quantized this particle inside the box. So that's what we are doing here as well. You have a gravitational potential which is classical, and you are quantizing the neutron or um, any other particle in this potential well. So this is something which people have measured already way back in the 70s. Now, uh, the serious attempt came from actually, very serious attempt came from uh, Page and Gilke. Page is the famous Page and Page uh, Hawking time for the black hole. So he's a very well-known physicist of our time. So they had this experiment and the, and the idea is very neat. So the, and the idea was, uh, well, the, the embedded in a semi-classical picture. So the idea is on your right-hand side, your energy momentum tensor, and that contains your matter. So the assumption is the matter is, super, uh, is quantum. So what is quantum, you can have a situation like showing your dead and cat and live cat. So the, part, the mass can be localized here and here in two different space-time points uh, in, your, uh, in, your, in your manifold. So now, but you treat the G-menu part purely classically, and you say that, okay, uh, when you observe the system, when you, uh, when you make an observation, you would find that localized mass is here or here. And based on that, you can try to argue whether do you need really gravity to be quantum or not. So, but uh, at the end of the day, this is a kind of like more like a statistical argument because you're taking, you're doing this experiment many, many times. And as you can see from the, in the abstract of the authors, they say that yes, what they found in the experiment is that semi-classical nature of uh, this or the semi-classical treatment of gravity is unfavorable, but doesn't necessitate that the gravity has to be quantum. So this is the conclusion which uh, came up from this famous experiment then way back in the 80s. There was also a false alarm um, way back in 2013 and 2014 when uh, some uh, groups, BICEP, uh, claim that they have seen primordial gravitational waves. So these gravitational waves, the origin of these gravitational waves coming from a very early universe during inflation, these fluctuations um, of inflaton had induced fluctuations in the gravity sector and those gravitational waves um, uh, propagated all the way uh, to 13.8 billion years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the claim was that BICEP has seen these pri primordial gravitational waves. Unfortunately, it turned out to be that they, were, they didn't see the primordial gravitational waves they did see some polarization effects, but not due to gravity, due to just astrophysical dust. But nevertheless, the, 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 the discussions or the, 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 uh, or the, um, uh, you know, the fact that uh, BICEP had made this claim um, made many, many uh, people, many different groups, many scientists very, uh, very much excited about the claim. And many people started investigating. And of course, naturally, one question to ask, but if you at all see the primordial gravitational waves in the sky, would that be a signature for quantum nature of gravity or not? 
Now, that, uh, at, the, at the time, way back in 2012, 2013, um, there were two papers which came out along this direction, one um, due to Wilczek and Krauss, Lawrence Krauss, and the other came from my group. And, uh, and the claim was that some people claim that, yes, you do see hash bar in your computation, so it has to be a signature of quantum gravity. But actually, the answer is not true, because uh, hash bar is a mere number. You can cook up any value of hash bar. You can mimic the hash bar by just um, some, some other way. So uh, it actually hinges to the point that you can tune your initial condition in such a way that it could be purely classical. It doesn't have to be quantum initial condition, which leads to these gravitational wave fluctuations. Even with pure classical, very crooked, very wicked initial conditions from classical physics, you can cook up to imitate the power spectrum of uh, uh, gravitational waves. So even if you see, say tomorrow or day after tomorrow, if you ever see primordial gravitational wave, that doesn't tell us immediately whether um, you know, these are quantum in nature. You have to do further checks beyond that. So that's another place where people thought that maybe there, there was some hope to see some signature of quantum gravity. Besides these experiments, there were many other attempts people made uh, from um, time related to the, uh, um, the, the, the ultra high energy gamma ray bursts and uh, time delay detection perhaps might tell us something about Lorentz violation in the in the sky while in the propagation, uh, but unfortunately they again don't really hinge on the fact that gravity has to be quantum. It may tell us something about the the medium where my photon is traversing. Maybe it is interacting with some other degrees of freedom, but it doesn't have to be really gravity or the clear signature of quantum gravity. So. What exactly do you need to really uh, settle this question? So this is a kind of like a million dollar question and what exactly should you look for actually? So you need a very sharp, razor sharp argument which will tell you like in almost like Bell's inequality. You need something like that, some kind of inequality or some kind of you know, uh, argument which tells us that yes, if you see the witness, if the witness turns out to be positive, then gravity ought to be quantum. And if the witness turns out to be negative, then you cannot conclude anything, or maybe, the, uh, maybe you would say that no, gravity is not quantum. So you need some kind of razor sharp argument to uh, put forward before you can perform an experiment here. So Anupam, I have one question. Sure. Uh, so uh, just one slide before you have uh, mentioned about the initial condition whether this is classical or quantum. Can you uh, uh, elaborate this thing a bit? Because this is a very confusing thing. Uh, like uh, we okay. actually don't know uh, in which scale this kind of transition happened from quantum to classical. That's the issue again. And uh, yeah, so if you please elaborate. Sure, sure. So uh, I'm not thinking from the point of view of decoherence. Decoherence will always be there. Mm. But the uh, but point is that even, um, so the question is you are generating uh, gravitational um, waves due to some source. Mm -hmm. okay, the source could be quantum, but um, again, in the semi-classical picture, you can think about that gravities could be purely classical. So it's the same as simple argument as that of uh, your, uh, the, the semi-classical picture. So my, my matter could be quantum, my scalar field could be quantum, which is responsible for creating these gravitational waves. But at the end of the day, maybe I'm, uh, I'm uh, I see the gravitational waves purely in a classical sense. So this is one, one way to imagine. The other way you can imagine is that what happens is that uh, the way you uh, put the initial condition, the initial condition in quantum case, you put a bunch of Davies vacuum, which automatically sets the initial conditions. But uh, now, I mean, you can mimic that bunch of Davies vacuum condition exactly in a classical way. And again, you would say that um, you would be able to mimic all the hedge bar which appears hedge bar is just a number. I can now replace hedge bar by say, say 2.2526 some number there. Or uh, uh, similarly, I can mimic this purely, this uh, bunch Davis condition, this beta k square minus alpha k square has to be half. That can be mimicked again, purely from a classical uh, construction. It might be very, very ugly, but it is- No, but in that case, it is uh, like uh, in the other case, like in uh, quantum case, you can actually build uh, the uh, like, you can act some kind of creation annihilation operator to the yeah, but here you don't have that thing no. in classical case. In classical, you don't have that, but you can mimic that. That's the point. Oh, okay, okay. You can mimic yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you know, you. it's a good question. Definitely, it's a good question. No, it's a little bit confusing sometimes. People uh, write in the paper, but it's uh, 
<laughs> that's why I, I have asked this question. Yeah. No, no, it's uh, good. Yeah. Good. So what you need is that. So that, uh, the what you need is a very sharp kind of argument, which has no classical analog at all. So you have to look for some feature in quantum mechanics which has no classical analog. So one example which comes up immediately is the macroscopic superposition. The fact that Schrodinger's cat, whether the cat is dead and alive, this cannot be mimicked in a classical world at all. So superposition principle is, is one of the key feature of quantum mechanics, which goes in again in quantum field theory in some sense. So that's one concept which has to be utilized properly. And the second concept which comes around is the quantum entanglement. The vacuum is very much entangled, like from the vacuum, you create a pair of electron positron. Vacuum does not discriminate between electron and positron. So what happens is once you create an electron, you cannot electron and positron pair. You cannot just talk about electron. You have to talk about electron and positron both. So the entanglement, so this is what it means that you cannot separate your wave function of an electron and wave function of positron. And the fact that you cannot do it, the states get entangled. And this is again a very much non-classical feature. It's not a classical feature at all. So the two ingredients which you need in any experiment is first is the superposition principle. If you can super, if you can take, uh, if you can create a macroscopic superposition, then you immediately put geometries in the superposition as well because mass corresponds to certain geometry. So the geometries can be now in a superposition. And similarly, the entanglement, as I said, that it cannot be captured by any classical phenomena. So it's inherently non-classical. So we, we do need these two conditions or these two ingredients to really make, make some move forward. And this is the part which we actually emphasize. So these are at least two ingredients which you need to test whether the gravity is quantum or classical. So um, you can ask the same question in the context of photons. Now, photons, in the case of photons, um, we know that uh, uh, it is quantum. And uh, the discussion goes back all the way from the photoelectric effect. And uh, even in the photoelectric effect, so some uh, experimentalists did not confirm or did not believe that the photoelectric effect would just tell us that the photon is quantum itself. So they were waiting for till an almost nine, the Max, uh, Max Planck Institute's quantum optics groups, they, start, they, they, they put the quantum superposition uh, uh, the, the wavelengths or the frequencies of a photon. So they created a Schrodinger cat state for a photon. And once they created it in a laboratory that was a firm, uh, on a, uh, that got photon in a firm footing that it does have a quantum feature in some sense. Okay, so even for photon, it took almost ninety years to even do this perf to perform this kind of experiment. Now, in the context of gravity being gravity being the weakest, it would perhaps take even longer time to con to do these kind of experiments. But thankfully, I mean, it's just a matter of technology now rather than the concept. So. So this is the kind of like picture which you have seen it even in Feynman's book. Uh, Feynman had a wonderful book on gravity and quantum gravity. So what it tells you that um, the superposition principle, which is very much innate to quantum mechanics, and it has been seen, people have constructed um, superposition, macroscopic superposition in a laboratory. And one of the pioneering group in the world is the Austrian group of Zeilinger's group, where people have actually way back in 2000, they took buckyballs. So big buckyball is 360. And uh, um, it's a fullerene system, which uh, they have put it in a macroscopic superposition. The mass is roughly one part in 10 to 20 kilograms, roughly of that order. So they have managed to put a uh, uh, fullerene ball in a noon state, sometimes technological terms is called a noon state, or GZ, G -head, GZK states. So these are just, this means that you can take the uh, fullerene uh, and put it in a spatial superposition, macroscopic spatial super, uh, superposition. So this is very familiar to the experimentalists. People have done this kind of experiment. So what you need now is that, as I said before, that uh, you can actually construct this kind of superposition. You can, now you can imagine that you have a Max Zender kind of interferometer where you can have a, a part of a particle in one arm and simultaneously you can have a part of a particle in another arm. And that shows that my particles 
or the masses, or in this context, the geometries are in quantum superposition. Okay. So still the question is even just from this experiment, it doesn't say anything whether gravity is classical or quantum. I still need to do one more step and that step will come very soon. And, be, uh, and before that, uh, before we go into that setup, let's come and talk about a little bit about a theorem which comes from a quantum information side. And this is the part which actually I didn't know. I was, I'm, I've never thought about quantum information problem. So when my colleague just spoke to me about the quantum information and theorem, which is called the local operation in classical communication, it's called LOCC in brief, I immediately realized its uh, potence and, uh, and uh, how it can be used for the purpose of testing quantum gravity. So the theorem states that, uh, say, and, and this is a fantastic experiment, uh, so you are in the other side of the world, and I'm sitting here in Groningen, and we are talking through Zoom. Now the question is, even if I'm, I have a quantum system with me, let's say that I have a coin, and the coin has up and down state. Let's say this, quantum, this coin is a quantum coin instead of a classical coin. So I'm talking about a spin up and spin down system. Spin up will be my heads up and spin down will be my tails of my coin. So head and, head and tails of my coin, it's the same coin I'm talking about. So I have a quantum system. And suppose you have a coin and it's also a quantum system. So the question is, if you are tossing the coin billion times, if I'm tossing the coin billion times, would I be able to entangle with you? And the theorem states that if the communication is happening through a classical channel, then I will not be able to influence your outcome and you will not be able to influence my outcome. So I would toss the coin a billion times, I would get 50-50. And you will toss the coin a billion times, you will get the output which is 50-50. So this is what the theorem states, it's impossible to generate or increase entanglement between two systems. Uh, so let's say A stands for Alice and B stands for Bob. They're doing a local operation individually in their respective places. But if, as long as they're interacting by a classical channel, they would not be able to entangle. The wave function will always be separated. And this is one of the most powerful theorem which was established way back in 1990s, 1996, by one of the figure, father figure of quantum computer, Bennett. So what are the local operations here? Any, kind, any restriction or something like that here? Any uh, local operation is where you can do unitary operation, like tossing the coin would be a unitary operation at my end. The same would be tossing the coin at your end would be a unitary operation. Okay. So that's the local operation. Okay. So any operations you're making to local, to local um, um, you can invoke some local, Hamiltonian behind that. Okay. And it has been reviewed uh, by many, many people in the quantum information. One of it goes into the heart of quantum computer, essentially. Quantum computing uh, algorithms and building quantum computers and so on and so forth. So this has been very well reviewed topic and you can have a look at uh, Plenio and Bermani's review in 2006. So once I came to know about this uh, possibility of LOCC, I mean, I didn't know uh, uh, way back in 2000, early 2017, once I came to know, it immediately triggered my mind that yes, this theorem can be broken in, a, in any scattering event. And this is something which I will talk later. So for the time being, let's assume that gravity is classical. So if the gravity is purely classical, and many people talk about it um, way back old days, I mean, um, die, or diehard person who doesn't believe in quantum mechanics at all, can still believe in classical gravity. There's nothing wrong in it. Classical action at a distance, one of our potential. But what you will see that immediately once you bring in the concept of special relativity, it would start violating some of the uh, even tenets of special relativity, because I mean, if there is a butterfly which is moving, uh, is waving his wings right now, I would instantly feel its effect sitting in the other side of the world. Or and the argument can be taken, maybe some, something is happening in Andromeda galaxy, I should be able to feel it instantly in my, uh, in my domain. So the classical picture is indeed very unsatisfactory from this perspective. But nevertheless, someone who is diehard can still believe in it. But uh, the question you can ask is, how do you generate a potential, even non-relativistic potential in a quantum mechanics? So uh, this is a very uh, old, uh, and, and well, it's a very well-known discussion which, which, which uh, occurs in any textbook, um, undergraduate level textbook. 
So you have seen it, uh, the transition matrix from going to initial to final state. Now, in any transition matrix, you, the first term actually goes from um, the scattering. Um, uh, you, you're taking the initial state and you're scattering through the potential and going reaching to the final state. Now, this is very similar to the experiment what Chadwick did. So he took a gold plate, he took the alpha particles, he bombarded the alpha particles and tried to figure out what's the potential you generate. So this is a kind of term which appears in your first uh, order correction in your perturbation theory. In quantum mechanics, the, when you do the perturbation theory, this is the first term which appears in your um, uh, energy eigenvalues. The second term which appears is the one which is very interesting because you see the, in the second term, you have a state J and you are summing over all possibilities. And that's the place for the first time where the concept of a mediator comes into the game. So J is my mediator. So I goes to J and J goes to F. And there are two vertices, and these vertices are given by a matrix element, VJI and VJF. So this is the, so the first term is a very classical picture. This depicts your action at a distance kind of argument that the potential is given to you, classical one over R potential is given to you, and you're scattering through the potential, your initial and final states. And the second picture is the one which appears in your quantum field theory or in quantum mechanics. Now, the second term in your perturbation theory, you can expand it. You can, uh, you can draw a space-time diagram when you expand. Um, um, there are two possibilities which you can imagine. It depends on the where the vertices are arranged in space and time. And when you sum them up uh, systematically, what you get is nothing but your Feynman propagator. And what happens is in the propagator is that your energy momentum is conserved at the two vertices, at the vertex uh, on the top and the bottom. But the cost you have to pay here is that there's an offshell exchange of a quanta. So in this particular case, X is the offshell exchange, which doesn't follow your classical equations of motion. By definition, offshell is a non-classical uh, entity. Okay. So, so essentially from quantum mechanics, you can, you can go to quantum field theory in a very simple uh, way. And this is the way actually the Bohm approximation and all these things built up to, uh, to create essentially quantum field theory. Now, still you can ask the question, the, what aspects of quantumness of gravity can you test in a laboratory? So I, I gave you the two examples. The, 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 both of them will give you the same one of our potential. The first uh, first order term in your perturbation theory. The second term, which appears in your second order term, uh, second order effect in the perturbation theory, but mediates to a propagator. Okay. Now imagine if X is your propagator, which is graviton. In the case of gravity, X is your graviton, and uh, this is nothing but your non-relativistic. So imagine you take two non-relativistic particles and you're you're making an offshell exchange of a graviton, and you are generating the one over R potential. Now, both class, the classical picture and the quantum picture will give you G over H bar effect in your phase. But there is several difference between the classical picture and the quantum picture. The second, the, 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 the other experiment which you can think about performing is that if you take a two cosmic strings, so you can construct a thin, very thin infinite string in your lab. And you can, um, and the, the interesting thing about this configuration, geometry configuration, is that the string does not generate you any potential at the, at, the, uh, at the zeroth order. So there is no one or R kind of potential you can generate. You generate the potential only at one loop. And this is because essentially if you, if you keep a string, it just only creates a defect. So essentially you take a sheet of paper, you cut it through and you hold the tip and it, that's nothing but where the string lies. So geometry is Minkowski. So there's no potential appears classically. The potential appears here only through one loop correction in quantum, uh, in quantum field theory. And a very beautiful calculation was performed uh, by the Caltech group way back in 2004. Um, and one can look into the, uh, the paper, I've, I've forgotten the, uh, on the author's name, but one can dig it out. Um, uh, Mark Wise, yes, it was Mark Wise's uh, con uh, computation. Wise in one of his students computed this effect. Um, how to, what is the potential due to very thin cosmic strings. But the phase which you compute from here, the phase which you would accumulate, it would be uh, proportional to G squared. And G is a very tiny number. So if you get some G squared in your phase, 
it's nearly impossible to detect this uh, very, very tiny effect. But if you, if you could ever do such an experiment, if you could perform such an experiment in a laboratory ever, ever, it would be marvelous because you, should, you would be able to see the well loop corrections appearing due to graviton. And uh, just to uh, um, uh, a side remark that uh, the off shell, actually in the entire quantum mechanics is built on off shell. The diffraction pattern, the, the, you put a beam splitter, that's an off shell process because you're tunneling through something, to a barrier. So the, the, this is something which is not very well recognized or very, very, very well highlighted in quantum, lit, quantum mechanics literature, um, that any experiment you want to perform in quantum mechanics requires the concept of off channels. So now you have seen that the same one of our potential can be generated classically as well as quantum mechanically. And the one which is generated classically will not be able to entangle the two systems, but then, the one which is being generated through quantum mechanically, through a mediator, through an off-shell exchange of a graviton, say, will be able to uh, generate some entanglement. And oh, that's I have, what we'll I have one question. Yes. Sorry, for, yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, these loop effects are very small, but like uh, in this experiment, is it possible to detect uh, that in some accuracy or something like that? We will never come close to any of, any of these accuracies because if you take any visible length scale for uh, in a laboratory and construct such an experiment, the, the effect will be so tiny that uh, it's nearly, nearly again impossible to detect such effects. Okay. That's the problem. Yeah. So we are stuck with G over H bar. That's another problem um, in, this, in this game. Anything beyond this in laboratory is very, very hard to detect. Hmm. So, um, so, as I said, that once you understood the concept of LOCC, you can convert that into LOQC, so local operation and quantum communication. Now, quantum communication is happening through this off shell exchange of a graviton. So, A and B are non relativistic systems like Earth and Moon, and they are exchanging off shell graviton to generate the gravitational potential between them. We understand how to generate the graviton, uh, we, we know how to write down the graviton propagator which has two offshore degrees of freedom, the spin two component and the spin zero component, and we can compute the, um, uh, the gravitational potential at the linear order and um, its gauge invariant uh, propagator. So it, at this level, at the linear level, around Minkowski space-time, you don't have to worry upon the gauge and things like that. The gauge issue will appear only at uh, higher loops or if you're doing in, a, uh, in an expanding background in a cosmological, then and this is a very simple calculation which uh, everyone has performed in their undergraduate level or master's level. So this one over R potential now has, uh, as I said, that there are, uh, there are two, um, two ways you can generate. And the, the, this is the nothing but your scattering amplitude between the two masses, exchanging the off-shell uh, graviton. And you can see that it is the, the, both the ends, the two ends, where you conserve your energy momentum tensor. Essentially, you are having a local operation. So the local operation in both the sides, the both the vertices, the exchange is an offshell exchange of a graviton, which is not a classical system, which is a purely a quantum or non-classical system. And uh, in this process, you are actually closing down this argument or the theorem, which is now, which you can call it as LOQC, local operation and quantum communication. And in this process, what will happen is that the two vertices, which I have drawn here, now they are getting entangled between them because of this um, argument. Okay. Now the question is, how do you realize this in a in an experiment? Now, so here comes the protocol. So the, it's called the Gemini protocol. So you take two freely falling superposed masses. So imagine that you have on your left you have Alice Alice's interferometer, and on your right you have got Bob's interferometer. Now Alice has created a superposition of mass. And Bob has also done the same. And you know that in a quantum mechanics, a spin is a very good, is a ruler. It's like in a classical mechanics, I can take my ruler and say, hey, this is five centimeters. But in quantum mechanics, I can use spin as my ruler and through a stern gauss experiment. So this, uh, in, in, in presence of inhomogeneous magnetic field, I can create a, a left, I can create my left arm with a spin off and the right arm of my interferometer with the spin down. So, 
So the idea is that you, for the purpose of this experiment, which when we, when we proposed way back in 2017, we use this uh, concept of a diamond. And the reason uh, we took diamond, because first of all, diamond, the density is very large, roughly three uh, grams per cc, uh, and three kilograms per cc, I think. And not only that, it has the, the important thing is that it has inside, there is a nitrogen balance point. So inside the nit nitrogen balance point, there is a empty bond where you can embed a spin. And this has been experimentally possible. You can embed a spin inside a diamond. So diamond now becomes a quantum system. If you can create enough magnetic uh, gradient due to say um, stern. So Alice has got a superposition and Bob has, so imagine you are doing the experiment side by side, then Alice and Bob can interact through gravitational, um, uh, through offshell graviton exchange. So this is the kind of protocol which we are thinking uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, of gravity. Now, uh, how far can you, uh, of course, this is not a very easy procedure. The heavier the mass, you need larger acceleration to create a superposition at the first instance. So in order to create a large superposition, you need large magnetic field, but it has been possible to show that, um, well, in the experiment, the currently people can use 10 to 4 um, uh, Gauss at, for Tesla per meter among, and the gradient of the magnetic field, and they can create uh, roughly micron separation, and they can hold that roughly around one second. So, and you can push this technology to create a superposition where you can have 100 micron separation between your uh, the Schrodinger cat state. So, the dark blob and the shaded blob, where you have spin up and spin down, you can separate it roughly around 100 micron distance and keep it for roughly for a second. So, such a Propositions available right now, in, um, way back in 2013, this paper which proposes this experiment to perform. Of course, not, uh, and not a single group has done it so far to keep it uh, for um, 100 micron separation. For a nanometer distance, it has been performed, but not for 100 microns. That's another challenge which comes up, comes up um, um, regarding the technology's concern. And then what you do is that you take the two masses and you let it fall simultaneously. It's a free fall system. So it's, you are doing it free fall precisely because if there is a TGV train passing by me, I would essentially not feel it because this is why these experiments have to be done in a free fall kind of setup where so that the stray uh, acceleration will not destroy this kind of uh, setup. And what you do at the end of the day is exactly like you're tossing your coin. You have tossed it and you're measuring how many times you're getting heads up, how many times you're getting uh, heads, uh, tails down. So at the end of the day, what you have to do is that you have to reverse your magnetic field and bring the superposition back and measure the spin and build the spin correlation. So how many times I'm getting a spin up and how many times I'm going to get the spin down system. And then build the correlation between these two halves, system A and system B, and then conclude whether the, there is an entanglement between the two systems or not. So that's the kind of experimental protocol which one has to follow. So uh, from theory perspective, you can measure the entanglement phase and that entanglement phase is roughly given by, in the Newton's constant, the masses appear, assuming for the timing that the masses are exactly the same, the time of superposition which you can construct and uh, H bar and the distance uh, um, between the two systems. So the largest phase appears when the, when the system is the closest, D minus delta X. And that gives you the largest um, phase entanglement phase. Now, if you ask yourself that uh, how big the system uh, has to be, how heavy the masses have to be, then you can measure this phase in a laboratory. So this phase, which uh, comes out to be, as I said, the GM M1, M2 tau divided by this quantity, that this phase has to be roughly order of pi, order one, let's say. So in order to make this phase order one, you need the masses to be very, very heavy, 10 to minus 14 kilograms. The separation has to be, closest separation has to be roughly 200 microns. And you have to keep this uh, system alive 
so that you don't destroy the superposition that the system has to be kept alive for roughly around one second. And the scale of superposition has to be this delta x in this picture, and delta x has to be roughly around 100 micron. So there are two reasons why we have chosen this set of parameters. You can improve this parameter slightly. One of the reasons is that the masses at this range also exert Casimir force. So you need to, and Casimir will also induce a phase to your system. So you, you want a gravitational phase to dominate over the Casimir force or Casimir potential. And if you demand that uh, the, the gravitational potential is 10 times stronger than the Casimir potential, then these are the sweet spot, sweet parameters which you get where you can perform the experiment to verify whether the phase is sizable or not. But as I said, the most important thing is not the phase. What is important is the correlation and this and W is the same witness correlation, which actually Belkins constructed when he was talking about the Bell's inequality, measuring the spins in two different bases. So sigma x, sigma z, and sigma y, sigma z, and stating the difference. If the witness W is greater than one, then you can say that yes, the two systems are now entangled. If the witness is less than one, then you cannot conclude anything about the quantum nature of gravity. So this is a very, very sharp kind of argument. Now, suppose if you destroy the superposition, maybe you invoke uh, the arguments due to Penrose or um, other people where Penrose is a very beautiful argument that he says that uh, essentially nonlinearity in gravity will essentially collapse your wave function. If you, if you invoke this kind of arguments, then you would never be able to even construct a superposition at the first instance. And naturally, then in that case, you will not be able to see any entanglement. So of course, this kind of experiment also puts constraint on um, theories like Penrose's argument that because of the nonlinearity in gravity, the wave function, the system collapses. So these collapse models can be constrained or the, if there is some decoherence effects, maybe due to unknown fifth poles, then also you cannot construct the, or create the superposition. And if you cannot create the superposition for roughly for this uh, experimental time period, then you can put constraint on such theories. So as I said, that this is the, uh, so this is the way you build the witness. So you measure the, uh, how many times on your left-hand side you get spin up and spin down. Same thing you do in the right-hand side, you uh, system B, you measure how many times spin up and spin down. You construct this witness parameter, and if this witness is greater than one, then you conclude the gravity is indeed quantum. Now you can say that this is a basis dependent witness. <coughs> that is correct. If you want it to be basis independent, then you can compute the von Neumann's entropy, which is given by uh, trace of rho log rho. To this von Neumann entropy as well, uh, compute whether there is an entanglement or not. Now the only problem. Uh, but, uh, is that you need to now compute all possible bases, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and all possible correlations you have to build up before you can conclude, you can compute the entanglement entropy. So this is nothing but your entanglement entropy, which is basis independent uh, criteria to say whether the entanglement is present or not. Now, having said so, there are immense challenges. The problem is that the concept wise, this is very clear, but uh, there are many, many experimental challenges for uh, this protocol. One of the challenges which we face is that um, the masses have to be 10 to minus 14 kilograms, very heavy mass. The radius of these systems are roughly around 100 nanometers. And um, you need a very large magnetic field gradient around 10 to 6 tesla per meter. And you, the gra gradient should be such that it can accelerate the, uh, this masses roughly with acceleration parameter 500 meter per second square to generate this delta x around 250 microns. Now you have to do this entire experiment in a super, super cool system. The temperature of the ambience itself can destroy the coherence of the system. So you need to bring the temperature down to roughly 0 0.15 Kelvin so that not even a single photon can be emitted in a black body radiation through the system. Because you're in the process of let, let the system fall, let the system cool, all sorts of things will emit, will allow uh, the system to emit black body radiation. And any black body radiation or any single photon uh, can actually destroy the coherence of the system. So it has to be done in extremely, extremely delicate uh, atmosphere. The, 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 the pressure of the system has to be very, very tiny. The entire system has to be submerged with a pressure where there's hardly any collisional uh, decoherence effects. The pressure has to be tenders to minus 15. Uh, 
uh, Pascal, and uh, the, um, so the pressure has to be very, very tiny. Uh, so there are many, many constraints like this where you, you have to uh, perform this kind of experiment. So if, it, if anyone can perform this experiment, this will be perhaps one of the most delicate experiments ever imagined to be done on Earth in order to verify this kind of small uh, entanglement phase. So uh, as I said, that um, uh, there are various um, uh, um, uh, you know, um, constraints coming from, super, uh, from the decoherence because there are many, many sources of decoherences. If, if you can think about them, even if you change slightly the magnetic field strength, because essentially you're creating the magnetic field through, through, through current. If the current fluctuates, the magnetic field will fluctuate, even that will destroy the, uh, and, and, and the, the path of the system. And we know that the diamond, the one uh, at the time we have proposed the diamond, even diamond may not be the real material to make progress because the diamond, the surface of a diamond has to be extremely, extremely smooth. If there is a dangling bone, if there is some defect on the surface of the diamond, it will create a patch potential. And that patch potential, when it interacts with the magnetic field of the stone garlic magnetic field, it will start jiggling its motion. So it will be very hard to control the motion. So we know that maybe diamonds, again, may not be the best, best bet in future. Maybe we have to coat the diamond with a very thin layer of helium. Because the helium is very smooth, so maybe the surface defects of diamonds will not come up. But then you, penalize, you are again penalized because the fact that helium, you, you coat the layer with helium, so, and then you need to supercool the system. So the helium temperature is around 4 Kelvin. But you are, if you perform the experiment below 4 Kelvin, then you are perfectly OK. But nevertheless, even if you perform the experiment below 4 Kelvin, what happens is that the helium surface can vibrate. And that can give you vibrational decoherence effects. So, there are, so everything is against your experiment. Everything is going against you. But nevertheless, if you can control all these systematics extremely well, then in principle, you can perform such a delicate experiment. So, this is the protocol which actually unites many things. You have, you have material science, you have the decoherence effects, you have a casting patch potential. Um, you need to cool the diamond from inside because there are phonon excitations. You have to kill those phonon excitations because they can destroy the coherence of your spin. And then on top of that, you need to find ways to trap. You have to levitate the system. And not only that, you can ask the question, well, this is about so far so good about gravity, but have you done this experiment? with the ions, with the Coulomb potential, because that also we know that it goes one over our potential in the Coulomb interaction, the photon is exchanged, the offshore photon is exchanged between two ions. And has anyone performed this experiment? The answer is yes. People have done this kind of experiment, actually. Uh, um, um, essentially with the, uh, and I have noticed that the incre increment in the entanglement phase and the entanglement In some sense, actually, uh, now CERN is very interesting interested to do this kind of experiment because CERN creates very, very heavy charge uh, ions, essentially from Alice experiment. And if you can take those very heavy charge system, let it go through your stern gala kind, kind of experiment, then you can potentially perhaps even constrain extra U1s or axions and things like that. Some, uh, anything which can potentially interact with your photon, fifth force or mini charge fermions, which can talk to my hidden or the hidden sector for uh, photons, which can talk to my uh, standard model photon and can change my say, Coulomb's potential. So th this is a kind of experimental setup, which can now be useful also to even test physics beyond the standard model at a very non-relativistic uh, regime. So how many, how much time do I have, Santa? Hello. Have yeah, you have uh, like uh, uh, almost forty minutes. Okay, so I have some time. Very good. Yeah. Okay, so um, so uh, having said uh, all these experimental aspects, um, let me uh, entertain you a little bit with the formal aspects. So that's what, what the formal aspect comes in the game because what you have learned here that um, so the, what essentially quantum gravity is telling me at the very linearized limit, at the linearized limit itself is telling me that because of the exchange of virtual graviton, you can entangle the two masses. You, are, you can entangle the matter system. So what it tells you that if I am entangled with you, then, and you are entangled with some other party, then we are all entangled. So you can build a tensor network 
where the pairwise entanglement is appearing. So if there are n particles in the universe, all these n particles are all entangled with each other because of just because of quantum exchange of a graviton. I mean, there are other sources of uh, entanglement besides the gravity, but gravity being the universal, this is perhaps the most fundamental entanglement which we can think about. So in this respect, if gravity is quantum, what it tells us that we are all entangled because the matter sector is indeed quantum. So uh, in, in, in quantum mechanical perspective, the only entropy which you can talk about is the entanglement entropy. Because if you're talking about system A and system B as a whole, for a whole system, this is a pure state entanglement, and so the entropy is zero. So you can talk about the entropy of system A or entropy of system B. So now you can entertain yourself and you can ask the same question perhaps in the context of black holes or in the context of formation of uh, um, black holes or formation of uh, even collapse of the universe even. So uh, I'll give you a few examples where you can compute the entanglement entropy for such a system. So uh, one possible way which you can entertain this thought is the, uh, perhaps this could be a new way, a noble way of even probing the ultraviolet aspects of gravity. So at low energies, people, um, even at low energies, you can perhaps potentially test it. As I said in the very beginning, that we don't know where the, the scale of gravity lies. So beyond say 10 to minus two, 10 to minus three electron volt, all the way from 10 to minus three electron volt to the Planck scale, essentially we don't know um, where the new scale of gravity appears. The new scale could be because of string theory or it could be some other new feature of gravity which may appear. It could be at TV scale, it could be at best scale, it could be anywhere. But nevertheless, if you, if you bring in the new scale in the gravity or you change the nature of the way gravitational interaction behaves, you, what you are doing is that you are you're changing the nature of the propagator. For instance, if you had a pure wild gravity, of course, this pure wild gravity has ghosts, we know that, but we know that because of the presence of the pure wild gravity, you are going to modify the graviton propagator. And as a consequence, you're going to modify your gravitational potential between the two systems beyond certain distance. And again, because the, uh, if you're doing this kind of entanglement experiment, perhaps there is a way you can probe this kind of, uh, if nature is very kind, of course, if nature is very kind, uh, you may be able to probe new features uh, of gravity. Now, uh, so here, just to give you an example. So the example which uh, we did uh, before with the two masses, you can construct the wave function, you can construct the density matrix, and from the density matrix, you can construct the entanglement entropy. And you can compute now this entanglement entropy for uh, say two different theories of gravity. So right now, I mean, maybe even if you're not interested in looking into um, uh, uh, blue, blue part, so blue part is just the I, Newton's gravity, non-relativistic Newton's gravity, which is the one over R potential, which keeps growing as, as it goes at shorter and shorter distances. And corresponding to that, you can compute now the entanglement entropy. The entanglement entropy also keeps growing with distance. As you bring the two systems closer and closer, the entanglement entropy keeps increasing. One very interesting um, uh, calculation you can perform, uh, keeping the same features in mind. Suppose, well, we know that uh, we have um, a black holes, and in the case of black holes, you know, we can compute the entanglement, and we can compute the entropy of a black hole, but it goes the area. In the case of black holes, it actually saturates. The entropy is saturated by the area. And essentially, no hair theorem tells us that you cannot add anything on top of it. So if you take two black holes and separate them apart, Essentially, these black holes are interacting via some offshell exchange of a graviton. So these two black holes are now entangled. Now you can ask the question, how the entanglement entropy is building with time? And you can perform this calculation instead of uh, now take, instead, instead of a black hole, you can now do the calculation with the 1D system, like maybe take, say, spin chain kind of system, consider one spin chain and another spin chain as your mimic, they will mimic that your black hole because spin chain has certain degrees of freedom and corresponding to those degrees of freedom, you can saturate their entropy, individual entropy. And you can ask how now these two systems are interacting and in, uh, entangling with each other. And what we have found very interestingly, you can perform this experiment in 1D, 2D, as well as in 3D. And you find that uh, because pure, just because of the gravity, your entanglement entropy increases logarithmically. And there's a universality here. 
And so this, on your left hand side, you see that the entropy versus time, uh, where n is the number of quantum states. So, and uh, the, the left hand side uh, plot is the one dimension system, and the right hand side plot is for three dimensional system. And you can do it for two dimensional system. I did not show the plot for the two dimensional system because it follows exactly the same uh, growth, logarithmic growth, as the number of uh, stage changes. So this is a very interesting computation which uh, you have obtained now, you have uh, computed, that there is a universality in generating your entanglement entropy between the two systems whose internal entropy or whose internal states are completely saturated. saturated. So uh, with this, maybe I would uh, like to conclude and maybe uh, I would be happy to take questions after this. So the conclusion is very simple and very interesting. Um, perhaps there's a now, now there is a, a protocol which is available to us, uh, which can actually potentially verify whether gravity is really classical or quantum. And the heart of the protocol lies is the correlation, the spin correlation. Here I have used the spin as a measurement device. In principle, you can use another kind of like um, ruler. It could be the position or basis, or it could be momentum basis. You can change the ruler uh, according to your need. But right now with the current technology, what it seems the spin system is the best system because not only the spin system, you can create the coherence, you can create the coherence length for a long time, but you understand the dynamics of the spin system a lot better. And it's much more delicate, of course. So you, uh, and in order to do this kind of experiment, you need this kind of like a delicate measurement, delicate performance here. But uh, this is the best thing which uh, right now, hopefully we can do. And in future, maybe with the current uh, improvement of technology, we can perform this kind of experiment. So the critical point is that you need to create the witness to the spin correlation. And if the spin correlation tells you that the witness is greater than one, then you can confirm that the gravity is really indeed quantum in nature. And if the witness turns out to be negative or less than one in this context, then you cannot conclude anything about the nature of gravity. And um, so this is a very razor sharp kind of like an experiment which one can perform if at all we can we can perform in future. Um, as I said, the technology wise we are lacking, but uh, this is a very excellent opportunity for all of us to perform, do this kind of experiments in hopefully in near future. So with this, let me let me thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for giving an excellent talk. It's very clear. Now, everyone unmute yourself and ask question. As many as question you can able to ask, just ask him. And uh, just clap for giving a very nice talk. Okay, so please ask question. So I, I have a question, do you hear me? Yeah, I, I do. I am uh, Raki uh, from Max Planck. We, we, we met like a few years ago. Okay, so uh, my, my question is, if I understood correctly the, uh, um, the theorem you said, uh, this LOCC, right, and LOQC. So when, when there is an off-shell of, uh, off exchange, of a particle, then then it's not not the same as when there is an on-shell exchange. But uh, I would say that every exchange is an off-shell e exchange. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. If you believe in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, everything is off-shell. So I mean, every every photon in this universe is a virtual photon in some sense, right? In some yeah. sense it is, yes. I mean, if you see a photon, it's, it's lost its virtuality, but, uh, and it becomes very close to on-shell, but in yeah. general, all the scatterings are indeed off-shell, yes. So when you say that classical uh, um, a co communication, that is sort of uh, ideal, right? Um, it's ideal, but you can imagine that suppose, um, just now I see says, the sun outside and uh, the question is the photon which I'm seeing is uh, so uh, so much closer to on shell that I lose this um, virtuality 
So, in, and so in the quantum optics community, they have been thinking about this kind of problems long before what, uh, before what I've been started thinking and many people in our community started thinking because they were always thinking from the point of view of uh, communication. And uh, so that's why they came up with this um, uh, idea of LOCC. And they, they, they pointed out that this is one way you can communicate without increasing the entanglement parameter. So you're not entangling the systems, but you're just keeping the two systems separate. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. Um, in any quantum system, there's always LOQC applies, never LOCC. So, so it means that quantum systems in, in, interact in, in such a way that you, you always have an increase of entanglement, Entangle. right? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this is Nitin. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So just, I uh, uh, have... just uh, show yourself in the video so that he can also know that who is this. Okay. It's on. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, I have a few questions. So uh, can you please go back to the slide where uh, you calculated the potential, the one by R potential? Uh, bit more. Yeah, this one. So, is this uh, calculation classical or quantum? Uh, you see that what appears is your uh, on your. Uh, so, essentially, I'm doing a scattering diagram. Yeah. You have a conserved energy momentum tensor at left and right uh, side of your figure. Uh, yeah. The two vertices, essentially, the T one zero zero T two zero zero, and what enters is the propagator. So because it's non-relativistic, so you're taking the zero, zero, zero components only. Okay. You're, you're summing over all possible momentum, so it is a quantum. Yeah, so I don't see a H bar here. Have you taken H bar as one? Um, it will not give you H bar at this level. It's just the potential GM over R. Okay, so a, a while back I comes found... in uh, the example which the, I... Yeah, loop calculations, right? Yeah, look at what you get. yeah, so a while back I saw some research where like I don't remember the exact things but their bottom line was that not all loop calculations are quantum and their framework was uh, graviton loop calculations only. So can you expand a bit more on that like because all this idea Gemini framework it depends on this test being razor sharp right. Yeah. So if not all like this is razor sharp because of that loop calculation thing. No, right? no, no, not because of loop calculation. It's the official exchange of graviton. I cannot do any, I mean, I can do loop calculation, but I will never see the effect because the effect is so tiny. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so effect, loop, loop effects we will never see ever in our entire uh, but the time that uh, it's impossible to do that experiment. Okay, so does that thing has any relevance here? Um, like uh, not all loop calculations are quantum in terms of- but here, That's what my point is that I cannot go even to loop diagrams here because the effects are so tiny to detect uh -huh. it. I am only sensitive in, a, in my experiment, which is roughly G over H bar. So what I'm talking about is only the tree level diagram. At the level of tree level diagram, I'm trying to uh, make my point that you see the first two diagrams in this slide. Yeah. The first one is the classical. Yeah. It also gives you the phase which is G over H bar. The second diagram here is through the offshell exchange. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, also sure. gives you G over H bar. Yeah. But the first diagram will never entangle the system. The yeah. second diagram will entangle the system. So this is the one which discriminates whether it's classical or quantum. Okay, so uh, I have uh, one more little question. Like, uh, you said in the very beginning that the graviton could be classical or quantum. So I didn't get what do you mean by a classical graviton? Okay, suppose if gravity is purely classical, then gravitational waves could be purely classical system. So they are oh. it has a bunch of gravitons, it's like a plane wave. You can think about this as a plane wave solution. So it's kind of like a soliton? Um, uh, no, I mean, like just a tiny perturbation around your. Uh, like a sound wave. Uh -huh, okay, yeah. Okay. It's a sound wave. It's some classical perturbation. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.
questions? Uh, anybody, please ask question. Shaptoki Shubhashizda, please ask question if you have anything to ask. Shubhashizda, can you able to hear me? Andrea, do you have any question? No, thank you. Uh, Claudio, you can ask question if you want. No questions at the moment. Needs processing first. <laughs> and uh, any any people? Any questions? I have one question. I have one question, sir. So, yeah, yeah. Please ask him. Please ask him. Show yourself first. Who are who is Shatoki? <laughs> Sir, I am an integrated PhD student of Nizer Bhuvaneshwar. Hello. Hello. Yeah, like show yourself. Hello. Switch on your video. I am asking you to switch on your video. Okay, okay. Okay. So am I invisible? Sir? I can't see you. Anupam, do you need to see him? Unfortunately, maybe the, the connection is not so good, so it's okay. Maybe. Okay, you please ask question. That's important. So, so can the slide where you show the plot of N3 between two black holes to you show the slide where there was a plot of N3 between the black holes? Sir? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you please. Ask. Yes, sir, this one. Uh, in the in the context of quantum information, sir, we know that the value of entangle. In uh, we have lost him, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other question, Shatuki? Can you able to hear me right now? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. But we so, can't we can't able to hear you properly. Internet so, connection here is not so good. Can I ask him a question email? Uh, write an email to him after this talk. Sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can always ask me to. Okay. And uh, okay, sir, any sir. other people like uh, Shaptorshi, Abhinash, do you guys have any question? No, sir. Thank you. Vaishak? No, thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Shubhash is the Shubhash should ask question. He's a uh, his uh, thank you Anupam uh, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I did uh, talk to Shogato sometime back uh, about this work of yours, and uh, I'm quite aware of it. Uh, uh, nice hearing you uh, personally. Uh, I, I, I have quite a few. Uh, I talk to Santan and you. Uh, uh, I'll write some mails. I, I need to collect my thoughts and then I'll write. Uh, so, uh, okay. but let me thank you again uh, for a very nice uh, presentation. Yeah, Shubhash is the actually work on open quantum systems. Yeah. So, I think if you don't have any questions. I may just uh, one. Uh, uh, yeah. No, no, I, if I may just uh, make one comment, uh, it's not related to your work, but uh, this uh, von Neumann entropy uh, as a tool for entanglement that we uh, should be slightly careful of uh, because it's a good indicator of entanglement only if the 
system initially uh, the total system initially is a pure state uh, if it is not then uh, it can create problems uh, it yeah, is not very uh, yeah so absolutely. so that's uh, a kind of a caveat there that's yeah all. there is a caveat there so but what you can do is that maybe you can see the growth that's the important thing will be yes yeah, yeah 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 just just uh, just for a kind of yeah okay that's all so uh, <laughs> like i want to ask one question <laughs> Uh, on the same line, whatever Shubhash is asked, uh, like uh, apart from uh, computing von Neumann entropy, there is something called quantum discord. Probably, have you heard about that? Yeah, yeah, you can do that also. Absolutely, we have not computed it, but because like quantum discord tells you if there is no entanglement, even if there is some kind of correlation exists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I find this uh, remark of yours very interesting. That uh, can uh, be used to probe uh, quantum correlations. So, uh, uh, like uh, Shantan just pointed out, you people uh, worked on entanglement. There is another uh, uh, after entanglement, there is discord, and then there are now many, many things. But uh, then one has to see, it means in this time, there's also a lot of uh, people are talking about things like you talked about Bell inequality, right? There are things called steering inequalities also. I, I don't know, these are all hierarchies of quantum correlations. That's it should true. be a nice uh, way of looking into uh, uh, what is the effect of uh, some interesting off shell effects on this hierarchy. You can you can pick up uh, various different correlations and build up. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. You can basically choose a model. Uh, Appropriately, and then uh, try to characterize it. Uh, 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 pretty interesting because these are all uh, foolproof ways of uh, just uh, kind of telling not just that this thing is quantum, but what aspect of quantum uh, the nature is this telling. So uh, earlier, 20, uh, two decades back, we used to associate uh, but now this is not so, right? There are at least uh, seven, eight different uh, signature aspects of quantum. So it that's is. True. It would be quite interesting to look into some of these features. That's true. That's true. We chose entanglement, one Neumann entanglement entropy, because the base is independent. Yeah, that's 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 agreed. Yeah, but you can always construct a, a, any other um, you know criteria, and you can compute. Uh, of course, <coughs> there's no reason why you should not. Yeah. But is it uh, von Neumann entropy is the strongest measure at, right now? Which is the strongest measure? To... I, I mean, well, you can choose here. I have chosen also the best. So if you want to look into the strong, ah, the, the, I would also say that it's the strongest aspect of uh, uh, quantum correlations would be the Bell's uh, thing. Uh, and But then there are weaker aspects also. So it could be that uh, um, weaker. Uh, more interesting. There could be a quantum mechanical scenario where Bell's inequality is satisfied. It's not violated, but it's still quantum mechanical. So, so these are very interesting things that one can look at. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, any other question, guys? You have? Uh, if not, then let's uh, clap again for giving a very nice talk. And uh, yeah, like it's really a very interesting talk and I will upload it in YouTube so you can uh, watch it later and ask him questions if you want, you can write him, write him email. And uh, Anupam, we will talk later. Okay, sure. Thanks. So yeah, like, uh, so we organize this thing in each Thursday and it, it would be great if you can be the part of that. So next uh, talk will be given by Jerome Quintin, who is a student of uh, Brandenburger, and uh, he will be talking about inflation and alternatives. Okay, so yeah, so thank you very much. So Thanks. thank you very much. Thanks. And uh, stay safe <laughs> in this situation. Uh, what what more I can say? So stay safe. Stay inside home. So see you guys again. Bye. Bye. Bye.